session, which is actually about the future of education in the wake of technology integration. And will we this please, or will it sit the play? So we welcome our panelists. So Dr. Kester, Professor Stigler, and Mr. Akabu, who will be chairing the session. The future of education in the wake of technology integration feast and of fate. I mean, the, maybe just to save time, can, can you just show the second, the second slide? I was inspired by this, um, by this picture. We are talking a lot about technology, about iPads, about, you know, uh, and then I saw that picture and I was wondering, is this going to be history only? Or are we going still in the time to come uh, to see our children or the grandchildren of our grandchildren? Will they still be reading books? It looks so nice, no? The, the, the child with the book. There has been a lot of investment in educational technology to the amount of 19 billion rupees. Uh, sorry, dollars. I'm sorry. It appears that uh, there's a lot of good in educational technology. But they, it appears also that there are some issues. Um, some people say there might be repercussions. People are talking about screen time. The, the rich, uh, there was an article called the digital gap between the rich and the poor. And people in Silicon Valley, who are very wealthy, they have become very aware of the dangers of technology use and screen time on developing minds. <coughs> Tablets ha are being distributed everywhere, hoping that miracles will happen. 800 or 900,000 tablets were distributed in Thailand. In Mauritius, 26,000 were distributed in 2014, I think. And it appears that we don't even know really what's happening. Uh, last year and this year, there is also another scheme to distribute tablets to Form 1 and for, uh, not Form 1, Standard 1 and Standard 2 students. Uh, what is really the purpose of educational technology? Is it about content delivery or is it about teaching the content? So there is a, there is a lot of debate uh, about the real purpose of educational technology. I think nobody can say that it's right or wrong. But I think there is a debate today. Because the technology is here, it's like the tail is trying to wag the dog. And uh, this is what we don't want to see happening. We don't want to see uh, a lot of equipment in, in, uh, in our schools, in our universities. And then we don't really know what's happening. Today, when we talk, for example, about online education, uh, it means everything to anybody. For some people, it, might, it means having it, you know, having your, your PDF version of your, of your books on your iPad, which you can read while you're traveling. Uh, for others, it means much more than that. It means really you, you, the instructional design takes care, you know, of the functionalities of educational technology. So in the midst of, I wouldn't say confusion, but at times contradicting outcomes, uh, in the midst of results, you know, outcomes uh, that seem to be, uh, are, they, are they contradictory? I don't know. But there are differences. So we decided to, to invite two eminent personalities, Professor Sid Mayer, from, uh, the Executive Director of the Tertiary Education Commission. I have to present him properly because there are foreign people here, foreign delegates, sorry. And uh, we have Dr. Keska, also who is from Amity, the Vice Chancellor of Amity uh, in Mauritius. And I'm sure that these uh, two eminent persons here will, will have lots of things to share with us in terms of what the they believe educational technology is going to lead us to. How the invest, what is the re return on the investment? How the investment that we 
have been putting in, in, in our schools in terms of technology? Um, have we done justice to, to all that money that has been invested? Just a piece of information, the 26,000 tablets cost Mauritius around 125 million rupees. And I think there is nobody at this point in time who can come and say, this is 125 million of rupees worth of anything that was learned or anything that was done in the schools. So that's why I'm going to stop here, even if I, five minutes are not over. And I would like to say, because it's, 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 it's just open discussion, are we going to start with uh, Dr. Keska? You have your, your 15 minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Apahu, for the introduction and for setting the tone for the presentations this afternoon. Uh, Professor Sid Nair, Mr. Apahu, and all the distinguished uh, delegates who are here for this uh, interesting session on the future of education in the field of technology, feast or fate. You heard in the morning during the uh, keynote address and also from the acting president and also Mr. Govind Apahu has given us an introduction of the topic, which way uh, the things are going, which way the things are moving. I definitely do not claim to be an expert on this, uh, in this field. I'm not an authority in this field. I'm one of the persons who are delivering the content uh, in our educational institution. The experts are there. Uh, since we are in the room called Barakuda, the big fish are there. Okay? So, um, just run through my presentation and then we can see how we can take it forward. Uh, we all know that the technology has impacted every industry and obviously education is no exception to that. We saw in the first slide about the books, whether the children will be reading books uh, in the future or not. And that's exactly what my next point is, that books and libraries may not be needed anymore. Everything will be digital, everything, all the content will be available online. They will be replaced by e-books, online resources, and we are already aware of the uh, benefits and of the wealth of information that is available on Google. We all have heard about Moodle. Currently, there are about 143 million registered users on Moodle. We also know about MOOC, there are 101 million users of MOOC in 900 universities, and they are delivering something like 11,400 courses. And this number is going to grow in leaps and bounds as we go forward. Uh, there are internet platforms available. There is sharing of resources through internet. I'm sure you are all used to all these things. You are all uh, practicing, using it, and taking the best advantage of that. The theme is about whether this is feast or fate. Now, let's look at what all uh, things are available for the learners, what I would call as the menu for the feast. Since we are talking about the feast, let's see what's the menu for the feast. Students have iPads, tablets, smartphones, Chromebooks, Dreambox, Xeran, ST Maths, all these um, software which are available for learning mathematics, for learning languages, uh, and arts, you have programs like No Red Ink, Achieve 3000, sites like glovico.org, through which you can connect with a number of people in different countries. Really, the wealth of information is available there. Let's continue with the menu for the feast for the learners. Sharing of resources we talked about. There are a number of multimedia resources like uh, which you can use and make your Presentations, very attractive, very interesting, sharing of knowledge, uh, delivering the content can become very exciting with the help of combining text, pictures, audios, graphics, videos, make learning really a more enjoyable. It becomes a sort of an immersive experience for the students. Learning becomes fun, learning becomes uh, exciting. And one can study at one's own pace as per the convenience of the timing, uh, you can make your balance of your other commitments, your official duties, and this facilitates the continuous learning, lifelong learning as well. Uh, 
while the learners have a lot of facilities, the same facilities, similar facilities, equally good facilities are available for the educators also who are delivering the content. And items like Quizlet or collection of real-time assessment data is possible. Uh, it's possible to monitor the students when they are answering the online questions, when they're taking online examinations through technology. You can also find out whether the student is getting any external help or not. You can even go to the extent of finding, doing the retina scan, uh, looking at the lip movements, facial movements, expressions, and all that. From that, you can make out whether the student is giving a genuine reply, genuine answers or not, or is he getting some external help from some other source. This way, one can check the plagiarism. Concepts which were easy for the students or concepts which are difficult for the students to understand can also be understood, gathered by somebody who is watching. Uh, how long a student takes to understand a particular concept, a particular uh, idea. Uh, some people will grasp it fast, some people will grasp it slow. So all that information can be collected, data can be collected, analysis can be made. And on that basis, uh, the purpose is to make the content delivery more efficient, more active, uh, more useful, more student-friendly, more student-centric. That is what the technology is achieving. And then, of course, for a standard brick-and-mortar classrooms, there is a time constraint. For online education, uh, for using this kind of technology, such time constraints are not there, neither for the learners nor for the educators. Let's try and see what is going to be some trends in the future. Uh, in US, 75% of the teachers believe that by the year 2026, digital learning content will completely replace textbooks. It's started happening and it will continue to happen at a much faster pace. There, will, there are a number of learning management systems. Gamifications will make the learning more interesting for the students. It can create engaging learning experiences Simulations and models will make learning, adapting, uh, grasping much faster, quicker, easier with the help of examples. Uh, we are all familiar with augmented reality, virtual reality. These really uh, are extremely beneficial tools, uh, facilities for the learners. Coding and robotics is also there uh, for all the part of the technology, which is making, again, content delivery more interesting. Smart classrooms, classrooms without walls, you can learn from uh, any corner of the world sitting at your home in the comfort of your home. Future technology in education, obviously one needs to adapt to the fast changing world. Both the learners as well as the uh, educators have to adapt uh, to the fast changing world. They have to keep pace with the advent, uh, advance of the technology. Students can choose their own way of learning. This is something a high amount of flexibility is offered in the uh, use of this technology in educators, in education. And educators can accommodate unique learning styles of individuals. As I mentioned earlier, some will be slow learners, some will be fast learners. So the educators can adapt, can tailor, design their delivery style to suit the uh, group of learners who is there in front of him. It may be uh, on a face-to-face -face basis or it may be uh, through technology. Uh, we looked at the benefits, we looked at the positives. Mr. Apahu also mentioned about some downsides, downsides of the technology and what happens when the kids depend excessively on technology. Addiction to technology is something which is uh, to be watched, which is to be monitored, which is to be guided by the parents, by the educators, so that the children do not spend too much screen time and the ill effects of screen time should not be there on them. Over-reliance on, te on technology impacts adversely on the ability to solve the problems. Uh, everything, the tendency is to find out from online resources, from, the, from Google and all that, you know, finding answers. Um, without giving a thought, without grappling with the problem. That is something I would say is a, down, a downside of 
excessive dependence on the technology. And of course, the copy-paste plagiarism uh, risk which is there, that needs to be checked, that needs to be controlled. Uh, these are a few downsides I can think of. What's going to be the shape of the future? Departure from one size fits all approach. The content delivery can be modified, content delivery can be tailored, content delivery can be flexible. There are a number of learning apps and artificial intelligence is going to play a major role in delivering the technology. Based on the needs of individual students, again, the content and the delivery and the style can be modified, can be ad uh, adapted. Uh, modified content to suit the grasping. Augmented and virtual reality. I have a small short film on this one, which I will show a little later. Um, as you say, this is something like learning on demand. Uh, it's, it's really possible to reach out to any online source and learn whenever one requires whatever course, whatever program, whatever technology one wants to adopt. That sort of a tremendous flexibility which is available for the learners is something great that the technology is going to uh, give us. And of course, the educators can resort to digital assessment. I guess that need not be clarified further. It's self-explanatory. Again, let's continue and look into the future. Let's peep into the future. Ease of lifelong learning that's going to be facilitated by the technology in education. Cloud-based education will be the rule, not just the exception. Uh, better aggregation of the students' metrics, more efficient data sharing, and more visual assessment results. Uh, these are all the possibilities. These are all happening and will continue to happen. Uh, Self-directed learning studios uh, will be available. And dialogic learning through digital media will have learners responding to peers, mentors, families, and experts in a socially embraced collaborative system. It's, a, it's going to be a truly mobile learning. Uh, will support not just going from one side of the classroom to another, but from learning studio to a community, whether physically or through a Google plus Skype-like technology. There will be personalized learning algorithms available. Diverse learning forms begin to replace schools. Seamless heads-up displays will equip learners with information, feedback of performance, and social data in real time. And possibly new certificates of achievement and performance that are social, portfolio-based, and self-selected will begin to replace institutional certificates, including college degrees. This is something, again, uh, the technology will push us into. I guess, uh, let me stop uh, with this presentation here on uh, this one. I'll just show you a small film on augmented reality and virtual reality.
Thank you very much. All right. Good afternoon. I'm going to take you to a trip. All right. A trip along memory lane. Many of us, or maybe me only, I'm a baby boomer as such. How many of you remember your university days of yesteryear? What's I use yesterday, all right. <laughs> What's their technology? No? No technology at all? Okay. Uh -huh. Let's start off with a definition of technology. Technology, this is a definition, is the tools and machines that help to solve problems or do new things using resources to solve a problem such as knowledge, skills, processes, techniques, tools, and raw materials. Based on that definition, were there resources at your time? Absolutely. So what the hell is this topic about the wake of technology? During the time I went to university, there was the wake of technology. There was the blackboard. There was a calculator, non-programmable calculator, right? There was even PowerPoint. So there was technology. At my time, which is not that long ago, but 30 years ago, it was basically a wave of technology where there were, it was used in the tertiary education system. I'm not going to the school system as such. Correct. Now let's move forward. If you think about technology then, Technology was used to enhance teaching. It was, I was not a slave to technology. What I had to do was very simple. I had to read books. All right, I had to understand the formula. And I had to apply it. Now, if you think about it, this is what we went through. That's much longer than before me anyway. <laughs> And then we got that. But the information was getting across. The student had to attend class. In this instance, why should students attend classes? So I went to class so that my so-called professor can give me the knowledge that he had. And I absorbed the knowledge. I used the knowledge. I furthered my knowledge by reading books. Technology, technology, technology based on definition. Correct? All right. If, that, if you do agree to that, then this whole idea about a wave of technology is a bunch of crap. All right? That argument will actually fall. But then you get into this argument feast or what's the other one? Fate. I'm not getting into fate. I'm not religious, so I won't get into that. But I get into feast. What has happened over the years is your technology has advanced hugely. But the problem, as Dr. Keshka says, is that the generation of now has got itself too much entangled into the technology. But then, then go back. Let's go back what happened about many years ago. In 1916, this is what was happening. People were reading. They were getting the information. A hundred years later, this is the scene. What a turnaround. If you're going for the argument in a wave of technology, what do you see here? As an educator, I see a pattern here. Anyone? Any pattern here? Apart, apart from the reading. It's the medium. So the argument comes back. Technology is the medium that you use to get the information across. A hundred years ago, well, I was not, I'm not a hundred years old, so about a long time ago, it was basically books. Right now, that same information can be obtained from your technology. So if you're going to argue this, the question I have with you is, what's the role of the lecturer? Why? and especially in Mauritius, I will actually pick, why do the students actually turn up? Why is attendance compulsory? I'll give you a very good argument here. I asked my daughter, who's in the final year 
of her, uh, her course at the University of uh, Queensland University of Technology. I asked her, so do you go for all your classes? She said, no. I said, why not? She said, I only attend classes where there is no didactic way of teaching. In other words, if I can get the information, why do I turn up? So go back. When, we were in, when I was in university, I had to go to the professor for the information. That same information that professor is giving is now available on the World Wide Web. So she, I asked her, in three years, she's done three years, she's got one more year. Three years, how many months did you go for classes? She said, one month. One solid month in three years. And she's a straight A student. And I said, what's happening here? Think about it. She said, all the lectures are on our learning management system. All the tutorials are on our learning management system. We got tools which engage us to see if we understand the information so I can learn myself. So self-directed learning. So what is that lecturer for? We don't need a university anymore. Possible argument. I don't want the lecturers to come after me on this. Possible argument, you don't need it. But what needs to change is primarily the way you teach. You're no longer a teacher. That argument is consistent in the literature. That you cannot teach the way you teach right from what 20, 30 years ago because the professors who are teaching you came from that system. And many of them are refusing to change the way they teach. The literature is constant, consistent in which they say that the students of today learn very differently. I'll give you, I'm going for very practical things. I've got my youngest daughter, and this is how she actually learns. Another straight A student. I tell you, guarantee, if the way they learn, I learn, I would be a straight F student. But they're straight A's. She has the TV on. She has a computer on. She's streaming music. She's watching a movie. And she's doing her homework. And how do you understand? But she comprehends everything that's happening simultaneously. Their brains have actually changed in the way they actually learn material. But we, with technology, have actually not moved. And I say this because after 30 years as an academic, the ac academic, generally the academic, are far behind the students in technology. Which simply means when you walk into a classroom, they can tell you exactly how to use your computer better than you can. Sorry? Yeah, that's right. Which simply means we can't rely on the computer for that. Let them go get the information. This is where the new wave, which has come in in the last five, maybe a bit more, five years ago, is the flipped classroom. Give them the information. They are responsible to learn that information because they've got technology to help them. You come in and make them apply what they have read or learned. This is where we have to move towards, to, to facilitate our teaching and learning. So we are very, very different right now. This is what's actually happening right now. Our kids of this, you know, because of this century, we say, past the baby boomers completely, are in such a way they have no idea what's happening in their surroundings. Engagement factor has dropped. If you look at the psychological literature, they will tell you this, that engagement is really critical. When you interview staff, all right, the first thing you know is they can't even talk to you. They can't engage. So you wonder whether you're going to take this person. So technology, what a wake of technology has done to our education system. All right, is it a feast? Yeah. Where's the faith? Now I get into religion. I don't know where we're going. We, if we think about it, this is where we are going. Everybody is going to be hooked on to some kind of technology. Let me put this, put it this another way. Technology is necessary. Technology needs to be used to get information across. But technology is not everything in your teaching. And this is where we are going wrong because we are pressurized by industry. Industry says you need to teach us this. But do you know, I'm, my background is engineering. The university taught me engineering. Walk into the industry, said, forget what the university taught you. I'll teach you proper engineering. And they will keep doing this again 
and again and again. But my, ba my basic argument is the students have changed. Our teaching and learning has changed, all right? But universities in general are not up to scratch on the way the current stakeholders should be taught. Now, let me give you an example of the way beauty of technology. In Australia, I had a parent, and this I go to a school system as an example. One of the things they do, she, she registered her, student, uh, her daughter in a private school. A week later, they gave them tablets. It's part of the so-called program. The mother saw the tablet and said, what's this tab tablet for? Oh, sorry, laptop. And she said, well, it's, they gave it to us for us to use. She took the laptop back. And she asked a very pertinent question to the principal. Here's the laptop. Can I ask you, what are your exams? How are your exams set? How do they actually sit for exams? Do they use the laptop? He said, no. If they're not using the laptop, how do they know how to write and spell properly? And the national exams are also written form. So she took the, tab, the laptop and said, you keep it. When you have the exams on computers, give it back. She can use my computer to search material, but for not for anything else. It's true, if you think about it, when we write, we got spell check. And some words, when I look at it, I said, I should know how to spell this. But my mind has decided, why worry about the spelling when it's going to be picked up by the computer? Give you another example. You might have actually seen this. When you go shopping, I don't know how many of you do this. Maybe it's only me. I stand in front of the grocery shop where the cashier is. As they scan it, I do a mental calculation. Anybody does that? Ah, I see. You do the mental calculation and you get an approximate figure. I've caught many times double scanning, things which are on sale, which were not, which were not priced in. All right? My daughters were sitting, standing next to me. How do you do it? I had to teach them how to approximate. And if you ask the staff there, they pull out the calculator and they punch the numbers in. So what is the so-called computer generation, the so-called technology generation has done? They have no, not know the fundamentals. which simply means I rely on technology to do anything and everything. It becomes a big issue. So if you go back to the stuff, wake of technology, yes. Is education changing? Yes. But are we the culprits? We are. We the teachers, we the system are the culprits. We have not actually put in what is required at the university level to be teaching. We have decided, new technology, let's grab it. But what's the effect of the new technology? I'm not going into the effects that the Dr. Keshke said, but there's even medical uh, research which shows new technology has effects on eyesight, hearing, and the newest technology is you know, alluding to where your mobile, tech, your mo your mobile phones can actually lead to brainwave, brainwave disruption. So there's a lot of things happening in the background. But I'm not interested, my, my more interest is, has an institution gone in and say, this is what we need to get the information? One is a learning management tool where you can get all the information there. But if you go into another sector like applied sciences, they put in every single technology you can think about. And you walk out of there, it's not needed. That's bare essentials. But we are in a system that is evolving. And it's evolving so fast we have to do something to help the students. Maybe I, the best way I can summarize this is to actually show you something that I actually got hold of. We are actually, what do you call it, developing systems as the system is changing. All right? If we have that goal, we'll achieve it. In my view is universities are trying to keep up with technology, not knowing what technology needs to be there. In recent paper I was just reading this morning was that they said we are using technology but we do not understand it. The academic doesn't understand it. How many of you know that some academics put things up because there's a policy in university that says it has to be, a certain percentage has to be on, this, on, the, on, on your learning management system. But they have no idea to engage those students in the learning and teaching. This is where it fails. And they got no background in pedagogical training into how to do online training. We have not even mastered lecturing. We have already gone into another direction. Think about that. So let me just play this video for a second. 
it might get the message across. So we are building a dream, but we have to understand what the final outcome is. In this case, what's the plane? In, my, in, our, in our case of students, my argument is we have yet to understand what the final outcome should be. Thank you. The integration of technology in education. Uh, just wanted to read something. I don't know if you've heard of Richard Clark. My professor. He wrote something some 35 years ago and he said, this is what he said about uh, media. He said, media are mere vehicles that deliver instruction but do not influence student achievement any more than the truck that delivers our groceries causes changes in our nutrition. And what he was referring to, he said, uh, we had good pilots and good engineers in the beginning of the 1900s and there was no technology. Of course there have been no people writing against what he has said, but it gives us uh, you know, some thoughts to, to what has been the role of, of, of media and today we are talking about raw technology. So now I want to open the, the floor for discussion and to invite you to or whatever you put the two panelists say if you would like to ask both the first question. Uh, if I, uh, you mentioned about uh, flipped classrooms, flip classrooms. I think this is uh, very interesting. The problem is the, the element of culture. Uh, culture evolves, but it would seem in Mauritius we don't evolve. In terms of, you were mentioning why do people still attend classrooms. I had the chance to work both at the Trump University and now at the Open University. And I was very surprised to see, although we do collectors only on Saturdays, to see 80% of students attending classes when all the materials we have is already uh, uploaded. Why do they need to come to class? Um, I think the cultural element, uh, unless and until we rethink not just the Dutch education system, but the whole system, um, because intrinsically students have been brought up in that manner. You can have the best technologies, you can try to change the way you teach. If you give them just materials and then you say let's have discussion classes, they would not read it. So the element of culture I think is something that should not be underlined when this made. I think this is very important. Unless and until we, we have a whole rethink of education system and I think there will be a lot of debate and discussion about it. Uh, the way we teach for the primary sector. We basically tell people what they need to do. We're not creating thinkers, we're creating doers, unfortunately. So the assignment of culture, I think, is very important and we need to be able to, to change it. Unless and until people have this change of mindset, as academics, but also students. I think the students, the recipient of the know-how needs to change for us also to be able to evolve. If, and I, I challenge anyone of my staff, if they are going to have a fully online lectures and have discussion forums, you can bet your life less than 10% of people, unless you make it unnatural, then the 10% of people will actually attend and comment on these discussion forums. Thank you. I, I understand the culture, but let me, let me go back to Australia when I was, when we started off. We were actually totally face to face lectures. The way we approached it was primarily there were policies set up, you know, institutional policies. And, and the system here is different. I mean, your, your policies come directly from the ministry here. 
But the institutional policies actually dictated what needs to be done. That information was transmitted to the students that were coming in. So we didn't actually start with the students at the final year. We started the students in the first year as such. And the first year students so knew what the expectations were. Now, I'll give you the flip classroom they used in computer science when I was there. In the sense, what they did was that they told the students everything is up there. It's up to you. But if you do not come to class, that's your choice. But we are applying the, the questions, applying all the theory here, which is what I'm going to be asking you for during the exams. And the class, which was, what, 40% full when they were doing face-to-face, -face, was 90% full when they actually decided to come and start applying the principles. And the, and the lecturers were very clear. If you do not read, don't ask me the questions. Because your questions have to be based on what you have actually studied. So in the first couple of weeks, yes, there were the so-called students, stubborn students who will not actually do the work. But as it went on, I think we did a uh, research on it. It was about 70% will actually do the work walking. We're not going to win all the students as such. But the 70 students who came in, all 70% passed. The 30% was where the issues were in terms of whether they were passing or not. Some of them were what you call brilliant students who say actually because this was a, uh, a sad story in the West, the students were brilliant. So I mean, I agree with the culture, but you need to start somewhere. And you need to start by pushing an agenda, and if necessary, pushing it at a face-by-face -face agenda. You know, certain percentage of the course is going to be done completely online, and it's going to be discussion after you arrive. And that way you lack the agenda. I'll just give you an example. When they put this flipped classroom, some of the Ivy, uh, you know, what, uh, universities in the U.S. actually strike the free classroom. And these are brilliant students. They started failing because they didn't actually, they, they were not trained to apply material. They were trained to basically learn what was given to them. All right? So basically, we have to not only, what the research shows, we have to train the, tra the trainers, and then the trainers have to make sure they were able to train the students what they were expecting of them. It is, a, it, is a slow, it is a slow phase, but you can't just throw it in. There's a university in Australia who wanted to do all flip class from year one to year four. And we told her, the vice chancellor, absolutely not. But he went ahead and there was a revolution. Primarily because the students were failing. They just didn't know what to do. They were not trained by the school system to apply information. Both for a very interesting uh, presentation. My name is Tanya Loka and I'm from the University of Kwasi Nutel. I'm actually in the law faculty um, there. I just wonder this morning we heard in the presentation that 50% of universities in America are going to be bankrupt in the near future. Um, at my own, in my own country, we have massive problems with student protests and that sort of thing, which has almost forced us to put our materials online and tell the students that you know they need to study for themselves. And just given the demands of um, the demands for education and the cost of maintaining beautiful buildings, lovely grounds, offices for staff, etc, etc, massive libraries and all that kind of thing, do you see the demands in the future of the traditional university? That in fact in the future everything because of the demands, but the whole argument is about education and learning and all that. We just, I just wonder if they'll stand up because there will be such demand for education that everything will just go on up. And, and people will lead into the university of their choice. And I've got, um, so, uh, like my daughter in fact is applying for a job at the moment in an organisation in Cape Town that just runs run online courses. They link to Harvard, they link to Cambridge, they link to the University of Cape Town. And they don't do university degrees yet, but I can see that coming. And I just wonder what is the future of the traditional university? Because to me it's so important. You learn so much outside the classroom. Um, let me put it this way. If you're a brilliant student and you're in the Ivy League universities, you can do it totally online. I think my argument is there is a place for a traditional university because not all students are brilliant students as such. 
Again, if you look at the research, if you do total online, the dropout rate is extensive. If you're a totally online university, you can have as high as 80% drop, what, uh, what do you call, uh, retention rate will drop down to about 20%. That basically because the research shows that if you're a young learner, most of the time, you do not have the ability to control your time and actually do the work what's required. You need to be mature enough to know on online, these things are all due at this time. So the traditional university will be more, I think, towards a blended form, not a traditional didactic approach that has to be. And I think open university is an example of a blended open university system where there is some presence of a, what do you call, some presence where you do a face-to-face -face and some presence which is online. Now, if I move from an undergraduate to postgraduate, uh, the University of Melbourne many years ago actually cornered the online market for online studies for postgraduate. Post and if you look at the postgraduate studies, and they did it primarily for the working population. Those who have studied and come out, they have no time to go back to university. But the, the success rate of the postgraduate when compared to that of undergraduate is success rate of the postgraduate is about 80%. When the undergraduate, if you look at, I mean, this is uni, uh, Australian statistics, will fall about 40%. Primarily because the traditional form, you guide the students through. So if you do a blended form where flipped classroom is, you, there is some kind of guide, guidance that is taking place. I don't think it will disappear in the next 50 years. It might be another century or so where we have a, a virtual university as such. But I think the current generation can actually do it. Not the generation I come from or the generation after me because they have not been trained to actually learn that way. You want to add that, add something to it? See, there are definitely uh, different sets of learners. One is, as uh, Professor Sitna has said, fast learners, brilliant students. They will adopt to the technology fast. But there are some students, even the parents, they still prefer the face-to-face -face learning. So what will happen is some sort of a blended learning is what's going to be more in vogue. Not that the universities will disappear soon, but yes, the dependence on online will go on increasing, but still students do require some face-to-face -face contact. That's, that's where the blended learning is going to succeed. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my, my is going to be a short one. Yes, it's very interesting, the topic, but on the other side, it's a little bit scary. Because, listen, where I come from now, students, yes, they are online and they enjoy it. But we look at the technical pedagogical training which you talked about, about the lecture. If, let's say, I want to go back to my institution now to say, this is what I got from the conference to the lectures, where do we start? Because some of them, they don't have this training and they are scared of even the technology itself. But we want to change to match the students. So where do we start from now? Yeah. I'm Dr. Namsan from UK I think what's important to also consider um, in this um, new way of teaching um, would be no doubt to look at and to incorporate the di generational differences uh, and also leaning towards uh, you know the blended learning. Because we uh, as well, you know, we're looking at the at the some senior people that come to us as well when we run our evening lectures and what works for them doesn't work well with our generation wise for example. So that perhaps is another key consideration. You're absolutely right. The pedagogical training is what's lacking in many institutions. They're introducing technology and then they say, we'll teach you how to use the technology. But there is a design factor that goes in when you design a certain activity online which allows a student to get engaged with the material. And, and if you don't train the academic, they're going to have basically information sitting there. I mean, the, the ones that I'm, I'm used to is primarily, there are not only discussions, but there are, there are the sessions where you actually, they go in, they actually, questions are asked, answers are given, and they actually explain to you why your answers were wrong and go back and try again. So that way, they're actually understanding. I actually sat with my daughter to actually take a look at this. And this is how they designed it. 
but they have what he called uh, design technologists, which help academics design this. Not all universities actually have the ability. They've got a center which is specifically technology related, helping them build this uh, effective, engaged online, uh, what he called, modules for them. Thank you, thank you very much. I think we have to end here. I think we are right on time, about one minute for some announcements. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kishkaz. Thank you very much, Prof. Naya, for your intervention. I think we've touched on the, the tip of the iceberg regarding educational technology. There is so much to talk about it, but I hope it will be quite thought provoking and you'll be able to discuss more about it. Before you go, we'll just one more well, few seconds. I would like to thank you. So, we'll have a token on behalf of Thank you.